Всем привет! Hi everybody! We are starting the standoff, and our first presentation will be delivered by Samuel Shah. A look back and a look into the future, decade before and a decade ahead. It's a fundamental overview, and it's very interesting. So, let's rock and roll. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen from all over the world. My name is Saumil Shah, and I am joining you remotely from my hometown, Ahmedabad, in India. Today, I have a few thoughts to share with you. These thoughts are collected from my observations and learning over the past 20 years in the InfoSec industry. My talk is titled, The Decade Behind and the Decade Ahead. And without further ado, let me jump right to the presentation. Where we're going depends a lot about where we came from. And uh, after observing the InfoSec industry for about 20 years, I just have a few simple thoughts which I'd like to present. A more formal introduction to myself. My name is Samir Shah. I like to call myself the accidental entrepreneur. Started a company 20 years ago and somehow have stuck with it. Uh, we at NetSquare do penetration testing for a living. And these past 21 years in the cybersecurity industry has shown me and taught me a lot, including the opportunity to work with some of the best and the brightest minds in the industry, whom I shall be quoting rather liberally during this presentation. This is a talk largely about four key areas. First, I'm going to talk about evolution of technology, of the cybersecurity industry, and several other things. Along with evolution, we're going to look at a few asymmetries, which are present and obvious, and some non-obvious. We're going to talk about cyberspace and the evolution of cyberspace and humanity within cyberspace. And last but not the least, we're going to focus on the key area that seems to be rapidly vanishing from our world, and that is trust. Before we talk about evolution, we must talk about two areas of evolution. These are two people I revere very much. On the left, you have Charles Darwin, who is regarded as the father of modern evolution, who is also the indirect uh, person responsible for the Darwin Awards. And on the right is a gentleman named Gordon Moore, who plotted the course of evolution of technology and called it very well as early as 1965. And he also has the Gordon Moore Medal named after him. We'll come to Darwin and humanity a little later in this talk, but first let's talk about Moore's law. We are at a very critical juncture of history where we're probably seeing the tail end of Moore's law. But in 1965, Moore prophesied that the number of components per integrated circuit shall double every couple of years. And Moore's law has therefore had several ramifications in the growth of technology and along with technology in the growth of society. And to fast forward to present day, what this has led to is a very sharp power asymmetry. Oil was the power of the 20th century. Data is the power of the 21st century. But there are two fundamental characteristics that we must keep in mind between oil and data. Oil, once used, is used. Data, when it's used, generates more data. Oil depletes, but data accumulates. And today, any organization or any nation in possession of large amounts of data has an asymmetric advantage over any other. And I'm going to sharpen this asymmetry by giving you a few examples. So if we rewind the tape about 17 years ago, I got to see a very interesting machine built by a friend of mine, Dr. Srinidhi Bhagarajan, who is pictured in this photograph over here. This is Virginia Tech System 10, which was built in November 2003. Uh, which was assembled out of the first 1100 Power Mac G5s that Apple ever produced. This was the first of its kind because it set the record on several fronts. 
Number one, it was the first supercomputer to be built out of commercially available PCs or Macs. It was also the first supercomputer to exceed a computing capacity of 10 teraflops, which was regarded as very high at that time. And that was achieved for a budget of less than $10 million. Sure enough, it was number three. So there were two more systems which are faster than system 10. But the budgets involved in those two were way higher. But what Srinidhi's computer did was something really phenomenal, what only supercomputers were capable of doing back then. And last year, I was looking up uh, a product called the NVIDIA Xavier, uh, the NVIDIA Jetson development board, which many of you may be familiar with. And a friend of mine referred to it as being a very, very powerful machine suitable for all sorts of fancy computation. And I was curious enough, let me look at the specs. So the Jetson Xavier is a four inch by four inch device about this big, just as big as my face, probably smaller, which clocks 11 teraflops. This is in November, 2019, 16 years after Srinidhi's 12 teraflop computer. And all sorts of fancy, it has like 512 cores built into a little square. The price, if I look at Indian rupees, it is like uh, 124,000 Indian rupees, a fraction of a $10 million budget. About, I would say, $2,000, give or take a few. That's what it costs. Anybody can afford this on their desktop. So what it means today is you have the power of supercomputing 16 years ago, and whatever you did with a supercomputer back then, everybody can do from their desktops. What can they do? We'll explore in a little bit. It occurred to me at this time that we have crossed a very key threshold. This was a discussion I had with my father and an epiphany came out from that discussion. In 2007, we surpassed an inflection point. The microprocessor became the new transistor. And I realized that my, my dad is a hobbyist electronics, uh, he's a hobby electronics guy, built circuits uh, during his early days, built guitar amplifiers and whatnot. And he used to go about building these with like discrete components, with, with, with transistors, with capacitors and uh, the likes. Like he used to solder his own boards, he used to etch his own boards and whatnot. And today you see like high school kids playing with Arduinos or with playing with Raspberry Pis and they straight away begin their hobby projects with microcontrollers. And if you look at the cost of a Cortex-M0, if you buy it in bulk, it costs about two cents per unit. You can afford to put a Cortex-M0 processor in, in every light bulb. It, it doesn't even cost that much incrementally. What have you done? You actually put a 32-bit microprocessor in every light bulb. Perhaps it's overkill, but economics and mass manufacturing make this easily possible. Another important thing really happened in 2007. This was also a very, very key evolutionary milestone. Because as technology matures, the ecosystem matures around it. And from the maturity of the ecosystem, new products are born from there. In 2007, we started seeing the birth of something new. Technologies like 3G, GPS, the ARM microprocessor, and portable power supplies had matured to a point that it could give birth to the iPhone. We all know what happened after the iPhone. Once the iPhone got in the hands of society, this ushered in the beginning of the digital lifestyle. The internet came to everyone's pockets on the go 24 seven. And society decided to put itself up on what we know as social media. But this is a new world. It's the beginning of cyberspace with real people participating in it constantly. While cyberspace was evolving, something else was evolving as well. Again, brought to you with the same evolutionary factors, high-speed mobile connectivity with GPS, with portable power, and powerful microcontrollers reduced to a very small size. 
This also gave birth to autonomous machines. An example you all know is the drone. Now, why was a drone not possible before 2007? Simply because the flight guidance electronics were too heavy or too bulky to be carried by a flying device. Now your microcontroller is really small. It is capable of processing environmental inputs in real time fast enough to make a flight correction automatically. The power supply can be carried by it and it can be guided by GPS and be continuously controlled over a high speed network. And these devices and the capabilities of these devices is growing. Um, in 1980s, 1990s, you would have watched movies about, you know, robots coming uh, in, into play and robots coexisting with society. Well, we don't see robots crawling around, but let me tell you, uh, folks, we're not far from that age. Let me show you what reality is. This is a Boston Dynamics robot. Check out the human-like or even gymnast-like maneuvers that it's able to perform. Such guidance, such dynamic balance and movements were previously not possible until all the evolutionary factors in 2007. Now extrapolate into the future, what's this thing capable of doing? What's to prevent it from being equipped with a weapon and take the place of a foot soldier in tomorrow's army. The possibilities are interesting and terrifying, right? And another example, we have Google's AI, which was demonstrated to mimic a phone call completely synthesized by analyzing the voice patterns of the user. And it made a phone call to a hairdresser booking a salon appointment. This caused a lot of backlash and Google had to shelve this technology. I, I really don't know whether they've shared it or they're still secretly using it. Who knows? But this thing's possible and this is terrifying enough. So let's talk about the evolution of the internet for a moment. Well, we'll we're going to consider the evolution of the internet since the inception of the World Wide Web. Uh, until then, it was the evolution of network computers and protocols that could transfer information. But true societal level information dissemination began with the World Wide Web in the early 90s. Eventually, people started building business processes on it. And that led to the rise of e-commerce, digital transactions, the commercial web, and the Web 2.0 as we know it. Next in the evolution factor, we encountered virtualization. And two products were born as a result of virtualization. Virtualization of technology led to the growth of cloud. And virtualization of humanity led to the growth of social networks. And as these thrived, a lot of data starting being accumulated rapidly on the internet. Now, what do you do with all the data? So there came in technologies, thanks to the supercomputing capabilities that we talked about that happened after 2007, we now have the ability to analyze terabytes and petabytes and exabytes of data at scale. If you want to think about how much data there is on the internet, there are these staggering statistics. So the last I checked, and this was January, so perhaps this number is completely wrong by now, but there are 44 zettabytes of data on the internet today. I, I can't even count the number of zeros, but there's a lot of zeros and a lot of commas. But the interesting thing to note about this is 90% of this data has been generated only in the past two years. So if we look at two years from now, the current data that we have is just going to be 10% of the data of the internet of 2022. If we ever see the light of 2022, I, I hope we do. Um, but what the hell is all this data about? What's in it? All this is our data, yours and mine. The data that we put, 
all the one billion good morning messages that Indians send out on WhatsApp every morning that can crush even a giant like WhatsApp. All the videos on YouTube and the scale at which we are accumulating user-generated data is staggering. And all this is happening because the data is free. We're not paying for the storage, but somehow somebody is storing it. Who's interested in all this data and what's being done with it? Well, guess what? The next evolution in the internet is AI on top of it, artificial intelligence, and what's going on with machine learning. You know, I used to have a discussion with a friend of mine um, about the effectiveness of artificial intelligence. Every decade, there has been a big hype built about artificial intelligence, and then it, it falls down. It, it doesn't quite stick. The whole idea of an intelligent machine rises and then comes down. It happened in the 80s and from there we got chess playing computers and it happened in the 90s and this time I'm afraid it's going to stick. It's not going to go away. And the reason why it failed in the 80s and 90s is because machine learning used to only happen on samples which are generated in a lab. A few thousand samples, few million samples. Today's machine is learning from real life. From all that data that we've accumulated, we have given the machine a view of our reality. We have trained the machine to recognize our own faces. One click, one like, one tag at a time. And when the machine cannot recognize now, it forces you to teach it with an insidious thing like this called a recapture. So tell me where the parking meters are or I'm not gonna let you into your paid service. This is, is getting to be a sticky road where the machine is gonna force you to teach it. And by now we can actually say that the machine is not only learning, but it's making us teach the machine. The next evolutionary fork I want to talk about is something that is very close to us cybersecurity researchers, and it is the evolution of offensive security. We've been tracking exploit development for about 20 years now, but 2020 kind of is just a blur, so my, my, my data is kind of up to speed with 2019. This is a photograph I have of a few of us in Singapore, me, Halvard Flake, the Grug, Dave Vitel, and my friend SK. Um, we used to back then write exploits for the lols. We did it because we could. Why do you want to do it? Oh, just to demonstrate that it's possible. And here, you know, let's point out to the world where the gaps are so the world could go and fix these gaps. But something very different happened, something kind of the, the, the industry took a turn for the unexpected. But actually, if you of us saw it coming, this is not a good way to go. But if you look at the way that targets have shifted, what we were talking about 20 years ago was attacking servers and this moved to attacking applications, desktops, browsers, pockets, and now the attacks are turning towards our own psyche. And technology is a kinetic enabler to influence our thinking. It's, it's getting there. What's in it? Why have the attacks evolved from you know, servers to the minds? The reason is simple, follow the money. The money trail will tell you what's gonna come next. So initially, there was money to be made in defacement and DDoS. You have a threat like, okay, give us so much money or else we're gonna DDoS the living daylights out of you. And then came monetization by phishing, fraud, spear phishing. Nowadays, the, the lingua franca for monetization is ransomware. And of course, let's not forget the big money that secret firms like Cambridge Analytica are making in manipulating minds. And this is also very much an area of evolution. So I'll give you a simple quiz. Here's an evolution quiz. What do you get if you add Windows with Bitcoin? Not a rich Microsoft, but you get ransomware. So ransomware is a direct result of enablement of cryptocurrency so that the people who can write malware can rapidly monetize it at scale. 
without cryptocurrency that loop was not possible to close the monetization loop and therefore we didn't have ransomware theoretically ofir arkin and i prophesized malicious monetized malware back in the year 2000 it just didn't happen until cryptocurrency came in um if we fast forward to 2012 exactly 10 years after that same picture was taken in singapore we happened to get together with our dear friend thomas lim what happened in 10 years of exploit development like now exploit development is not just for the laws it's become commercialized weaponized and now it's become politicized as well if we actually look at the next wave of exploits we already heard about them I'm sure you've all heard about Rohammer, Specter, and Meltdown. These are fancy attacks, in in my opinion. But these are hardware level attacks, which were only once speculated as being theoretical. In the past four years, we've seen the theoretical become practical. We've seen how twiddling bits by simply accessing various areas of the DRAM by observing its geometry can cause precision bit flips enough to get privilege escalation. we've seen how speculative ex- execution in cpus and branches and pipelining can be tricked in order to make it follow code paths which are not supposed to be followed can we effectively answer the question that have these attacks gone away not really we've just swept them under the carpet they're not on the radar because they are not being exploited in mass yet perhaps there's an evolutionary factor which is not yet born but when it comes around the corner all old attacks like these will suddenly become practical and tomorrow if we just start seeing phones go berserk or computers starting to melt down we'll realize that something's happened which has made these things rapidly possible i used to also dabble into covert exploit delivery and one of my one of my tricks was stego exploit it's taking advantage of certain design weaknesses in browsers where you know you could hide exploit code as pixels and then combine the decoder as a polyglot and deliver it even till date even after about 4 years of disclosure of stego exploit and precursors of it were disclosed about 7 years ago browser are still allowing such code execution to be possible it hasn't ex- been exploited in mass yet but we're getting like a few reports are trickling in now as an industry what have we done with exploits right we've always had knee jerk reactions to exploits like okay if there's a problem we as a security industry have to rush and fix it but if we step aside and look at the tape from the past 20 years to present day we've just had a tom and jerry game we're just playing catch up and this is no way to live and assure any sort of security But the truth is i came to know of this one simple fact that there will be vulnerability there's no getting around it and this revelation was actually uh, came to me through an architecture blog where the author of the architecture blog coined a term called nakatomi space modeled after the famous die hard movies where bruce willis can go up and down a tower without using the intended means of tower traversal that is he doesn't use an elevator and doesn't use stairs he goes through an air conditioning duct he goes through cables he goes out on the surface he goes anywhere but the stairs and the elevators and he was able to traverse more areas of the building this way than what the intended purpose was and the truth is that any complex system product network will have tons and tons of nakatomi space in it so instead of trying to fix every hole you cut off the air conditioning duct the building doesn't become breathable instead of trying to uh, you know patch all the holes let us start looking in areas which are non obvious to find how a system could be misused and that's what we hackers were doing back then showing how it could be done but then as we started showing this there were more knee jerk reactions there were two timelines at this point the first timeline saw the evolution of a new species which my friend halvar flake has called the mitigator a whole slew of exploit mitigation technologies has been born 
ever since the early 2000s in an attempt to stop exploitation. This continues, but even till date, we still see stack overflows rated as one of the most commonly exploited bugs, even till date. They have not gone away. But a more disturbing timeline started creeping in around 2001. This was centric to Microsoft when it was getting more market share. The worms happened. The code red worm, the Nimda worm, and all these configure worms happened much later, but worms were giving Microsoft a bad name. And there was a knee-jerk reaction from Microsoft HQ. Strong memos were being written to end the information anarchy calling the researchers as criminals and uh, a call for action was that this has to end somehow. Well, I don't know what transpired at Microsoft HQ, but I'm sure this led to directly Bill Gates drafting and sending out that famous trustworthy computing memo. Gates got the right idea that if we can't make computers trustworthy, and people are not going to be take, going to be able to take advantage of them. Right idea, but Microsoft took the wrong medicine. They decided to catch all the researchers and gag them permanently. I was part of some of those meetings that happened in closed doors in Las Vegas in 2002. All the who's who of the researchers were there. So Microsoft told all of us. Like if you stop, if you don't stop publishing vulnerability research, we're going to stop doing consulting with you. So at that time, it just meant that they cut off our air supply. So everybody complied saying, yes, sir, we are going to be silent. There was a gag order on vulnerabilities. Those who dared disclose vulnerabilities were meant with severe punitive action. I have seen a flight of lawyers fly in from Cisco HQ on a private jet the night before Black Hat 2005, and literally tear out presentations made by Michael Lynn with, with you know, cutter knives out of the presentation materials. Now remember, back then it was all printed and everybody got a copy. So Michael Lynn still went on stage and did his presentation. He got vilified and the whole, whole lawyer drama and, and massive drama happened, which is nothing compared to Twitter drama these days, by the way. But that, yeah, that happened. And that as an industry led to researchers saying, you know what, forget it. We're trying to work with you. We're not going to work with you anymore. And the defense side of the cybersecurity industry degenerated only into three areas. Security became a measure of risk reduction. You go to any expo, physical or virtual, all the products that they're selling can be classified into just three areas. All of these products depend upon rules, signatures and updates. And now, of course, to get VC funding, machine learning, otherwise you're not going to get your money. But that's it. Security is still reactive and it has not kept up pace with the attacks. Let's very quickly talk about cyberspace and how it has evolved. Cyberspace is like a planet within a planet. And I started thinking about it as a different world. You know, what happens when you travel a different world? You're an explorer. You want to explore new laws of physics, of chemistry, biology, of nature, how the environment is on a different planet. So the first thing that cyberspace explorers find is that nature's laws don't apply in cyberspace. And ironically, neither do your governments. It's a whole brave new world. But cyberspace has evolved over several years. And so some of the early maps were drawn by XKCD. Randall Munro did these maps of cyberspace. They're, they're fantastic. And yeah, along with the cyberspace, there are also the cyber evils, the, the, the pirates of cyberspace, and what, what piracy or attacks were going on back then. And then as cyberspace evolved, you know, countries like MySpace just vanished and Facebook became continents. The level of attacks also amplified. And I think by 2010, there were no more maps of cyberspace published. But I started figuring out if we take the map of today's world, we as global citizens are actually tenants of the new emerging digital republics. 
each of these flags that you see in front of you has the budget more than an average country's government has. But it doesn't have any governance. There's no due process. There's no laws. There's no system of justice. There's no elections. These are governed by boards whose motto or bottom line is to increase shareholder value. That's, that's what these uh, republics in the digital age are doing. And you as a digital citizen are forced to be a tenant of one of these. You do not have rights. You're just a tenant. You're not a citizen. You just have to have tenancy under one of one or more of these flags. So sometimes I, as an Indian, question, who, who am I really? Do I have a Google passport? Do I have a Facebook passport? Do I have an Apple passport in, in, the, in the virtual world? I do have an Indian passport in the real world. It's a question which I'm still not being able to answer clearly. If we look at the biology of cyberspace, there's a very interesting revelation that cells and pixels are indistinguishable from one another. When you enter cyberspace, everything looks the same, whether it's real or virtual. Human faculties for threat detection fail in cyberspace. You're not able to recognize a phishing email from a genuine email simply because of this reason. We, we as humans are not built to recognize malicious pixels or friendly pixels. And therefore what happens is our millions of years of evolution are failing us when we go to this new planet. And what is common sense in reality is ignorance in virtuality. And here's a very interesting paper that I encourage all of you to read. It's titled Computerization, Discretion and Freedom, written by a friend of mine, Sergey Bratis, and his colleague, Hannah Shubina. And a statement that I'm going to quote from there is that computers modify our behaviors related to discretion, to professional autonomy, and ultimately to moral choice. Yes, let us not be under any illusion that computers are not influencing us. We are at the cusp where we may end up obeying orders from a machine, whether we know it or not. And that begets the whole question that in cyberspace, where are we really living? We are living from crisis to crisis. And whatever is flashed on our screens and five scrolls down, the thumb is the world that we inhabit. So whether it's COVID-19 or the BLM movements or the US elections or whatever is gonna come up next, the entire population is just gonna swing from these from here or there. A few months ago, uh, the BLM movement was very strong. It was all over the social media. Today, if you see, the U.S. elections are rapidly eclipsing BLM. But we all saw it coming. Now what's going to come next? We don't know. But something's going to come, for sure. And the truth is that whenever you're in cyberspace, it has a, it has a reality distortion field of its own. Cyberspace distorts reality. This is a law of cyberspace physics. And I'll give you an example. We, we have the power of instant messaging for free. And here's a message I received from a friend of mine. Um, this happened when I was actually going to Southern India to see a solar eclipse on December 26, 2019. Um, this lady sends a message saying, hey, I got this message saying there's, there's a phenomenon that there are gonna be two suns in the sky on this particular date, and this happens when the Earth changes axis, and some pseudoscience was being applied. And look, these pictures are fantastic, you know, just wanted to share this with you. Now, this is a very intelligent lady. I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not saying she doesn't know. She saw this message, found it moderately interesting, and because she has the power to share, instantly shared it with her friends. Where was the fact checking? Nothing. The only planet I know that has two suns is Tatooine and I haven't been there yet. But how do we get here? The truth is in this diagram, right? We, we live in the age of miracles. For a brief moment in history between the invention of camera and the invention of Photoshop, the world saw no miracles. Before the camera was invented, the world was full of miracles. Magical world. And after Photoshop is invented, the world became magical again. We had that brief period where, where you know, reality and media mirrored one another. But no more now. And it's a result of Photoshop at work. And that has kind of led to the 
evolution, or shall I say the devolution of experts. And what used to be opinions of leading scientists in the 80s are now replaced by Karens on Facebook. And that's where we're getting our source of truth from. And the source of truth that we get these days is, is powerful enough. It's powerful enough for humanity to start winning Darwin Awards. It's powerful enough for people to take to space travel. This is not a joke. This was real. Mad Mike Hughes built a rocket to launch himself into space to prove that the Earth was flat. And the only thing that happened was he got flattened himself because the rocket failed and it crashed to Earth. And that was uh, the end of uh, an attempt that eventually would probably get him the Darwin Award. And the reason is, if you try to argue against popular opinion, you're going to very rapidly encounter the bullshit asymmetry. The statement that the amount of energy necessary to refute bullshit is an order of magnitude bigger than to produce it. You, you're never going to win the opinions of a Karen on the internet. If we look around our social network, we also want to ask ourselves, who are we getting influenced by? And here, if I, this was a thought experiment I did with a few people. Like, you know, identify the explorer in your social networks and you'd perhaps point to lady number one, who is a mountaineer of sorts, or identify the literature professor and that would be lady number three. Or then it got sharper, like identify the next, uh, the next unicorn CEO and that could be a toss up between person number two or person number four or the uh, toss up between the next journalist or the next investigative reporter, which would be like, you know, person number five or seven. But what happened is that the entire audience was just playing through with their cognitive bias. And when I revealed to them the truth, the truth is this person does not exist. All these images are generated by artificial neural networks. You can go to the website called this person does not exist.com and you'll see a new pseudo real person pop up every time you hit refresh. And what is to say that we are not actively being manipulated by silicon based life forms? Because in cyberspace chemistry, carbon is equal to silicon. Carbon has a valency of four atoms in its outer orbit, so does silicon. And the extrapolations from then on are phenomenal. These two individuals were caught running a deep fake network. But they were not running it. They were the deep fake network. These two people are fakes. They are completely generated by neural networks. And they were participating actively on a daily basis in certain social networks. And people are being influenced by these digital ghosts. And therein lies a funny story or an interesting story. I want to tell you, this is based in some of our Indian culture, old heritage stories of uh, four very learned students who learned these arts and they were crossing the forest to go to their houses for a vacation. They come across the bones of a dead animal. And one of them steps up and says, hey, you know what, with my new knowledge, I can put the skeleton together. And the second one says, I can do better. I can actually put the flesh and bones together and the skin. And the third guy says, hey, I'm the best student. I can put this creature to, like, I can bring this creature to life. I have the master power of them all. And the fourth guy says, that, hey, look, you know, you guys don't know what you're doing. And these three in turn turn around to this so-called dullard, the so-called dumb guy and says, you know, you don't know anything. Why are you stopping us from using our knowledge? Sure enough, this guy, dumb guy climbs a tree. The lion comes to life. And what happens is very, very clear to see. Everybody who is working in the high-tech industry today is putting this very attractive lion that you see on the right-hand side, the day it comes to life, run. So if we want to see where we're going to go with the internet and digital society beyond this, I urge you to watch two movies, Terminator, and the next stop is The Matrix. So if you ask me about cybersecurity predictions in 2020, well, it ain't pretty. You're going to have definitely a lot of deep fakes, deception campaigns, and digital destabilization. Tune into the US elections for more info. The days of news media are over. There's totally no credible source of truth left in news media these days. Everybody's bickering, and everybody's trying to snatch money from those who pay them money 
to put forward biased agenda you can like you know fight with me but the truth is out there for you to see we also going to very rapidly see unmanned armed forces and terrifying line of unmanned civilian law enforcement so it's in, in in a very orwellian future you know this quote comes to mind that eventually what belongs to you is nothing more than those few cubic centimeters inside your skull and that too technology is kind of getting at let's rewind the tape and figure out how we got here in the first place right like where did we turn left at albuquerque let me ask you a question what's the difference between apple and google other than the logos and this answer was told to me by a friend of mine harun meer who i respect very much apple sells to you google sells you if you are not paying for the product you are the product and we have been sold over the years and mass populations and there's an evolution to monetization as well in 2010s we were sold by targeted advertising people were making money by targeting ads to us it's gone now ad blockers win in 2020 the monetization is by predictions and assured outcomes pay cambridge analytica 3 billion dollars and they'll win you an election it's not far from the it's it's fictional who knows you can find out about it but this can happen very well and as an industry as a cyber security industry i feel the onus is on us instead of protecting our users we as a technology and a cyber security industry we monetize them if we want to have any security the first step is to recognize the problem that exists between keyboard and chair the human factor and this takes me back to 2015 two tweets that i remember to these days by the grub and sebastian porst the grub was commenting about how effective phishing is compared with apt and sp made a very valid point which has stuck with me till date is that user hardening efforts have not made any progress compared to software hardening over the years and thomas dulin halvard flake also underscored this in his black hat 2017 keynote that organizations have plenty of volunteers to add layers of complexity but none to reduce the attack surface and this is why we are not building a defendable internet we as an industry are to blame because whenever we think of users we yes we as a cyber security industry and i'm looking at you we are to blame because we have always made fun of users we always vilified users and i being one of them i am not excluding myself we always view the user as user as stupid give a user technology and they'll do stupid things like tweet out pictures of their debit cards but sure enough they do that but not all users fall in this category not all users are going to pick dancing pigs over security they pick that because they are forced to because of dark patterns because of incomprehensible ui which has made security a very complex and a painful process just try setting up gpg and maintaining it you know and you you'll see why so as an industry i say we are to blame for first of all applying this one size fits all formula to all users this is our problem we better own it and so for now i want to talk to you and focus about what are we going to do to be able to restore trust there's something that we as an industry need to own and we need to make the change right now the one thing i learned about the whole covid experience is while this is a time of adversity is also a time of opportunity i have seen more change happen in digital society in these past 3 months than i have seen in the past 20 years as a cyber security practitioner what was always viewed upon as impossible it's going to be too much of inertia to make a change has happened in weeks the world is ready for change 
the world is receptive for change. So take this opportunity now, make the changes, and restore the trust, and I guarantee you we're going to have a path towards security. This brings me to my own theorem of solution spaces, which states that the solution to any problem lies in a distinctly different space than the problem space itself. In other words, if a problem is created by technology, don't try and solve it by technology. This is why firewalls, antivirus, endpoint security, all these DLP thingies have still failed to protect us from the next new signature that pops up and hits us in our face. If we want to think about restoring trust, we've got to look at different analogies. And one of the analogies was proposed by, uh, by another friend of mine. We all know what a bank statement is. Right? We've all seen these. You get a bank statement, we know what's in our account. Why do we need the statement for? Well, the statement tells us what we've done with our account. It tells us our habits. It tells us where the big money is going. It allows us to verify and reconciliate what's happened. It allows us to catch unauthorized expenses and correct these actions. In short, this is the way that the bank wins the customer's trust. We'll give you a transparent list of activities for you to analyze and act upon, and therefore we win your trust and we provide you a trustworthy tried and tested system. Thomas Dulin made a statement like, why can't we make a bank statement for apps or software activity, why can't the next generation operating system make all the apps accountable and present the user with a transactional level activity of what each app did? How many times did it turn on the mic? How many times did it read your clipboard? How many times did it send you a tracking pixel? How many times did it, uh, you know, time it you know, dipped into your photographs? How many times it synced your contact books? Once the user sees what these apps are doing under the layer, the user will be able to better demand a security posture from the vendors, or the vendors are going to have this problem like, yeah, we better appeal to the user or we're going to lose the business, make it transparent. So these are my statements to the industry. Stop thinking about security as a reactive process. Stop buying products, for God's sake. Stop spending and adding more layers to make your technical, increase your technical debt. First thing you want to do is you want to put the user in control. Make the user responsible for the security. And I have a theory about it. I told you that users, one size doesn't fit all. There are actually four categories of users. I've been working on this user maturity curve for a while. So if we plot the number of users versus the maturity, you get four different areas. You have the hopeless users. Nothing you can do will help them. On the other end, you have the rock star users, which are outperforming your expectations. And you shouldn't do anything to them. Leave them alone. They're doing better than you expected. Instead, instead learn from them. There's a whole bunch of users which are the proactive users, which are doing great. And they're on their way to becoming next rock stars. You don't want to mess with them at all. You don't want to make them change their password every month because of some stupid uh, audit level compliance bullshit. What you really want to do is you want to make security accessible to the uninformed users. These are users with the right intentions, but they do not have the means of taking charge of their own security. It's just too complex for them. One fourth of your user base is your target area to act upon. All you have to do you shift them from uninformed to proactive, and you want to change the curve, everything's going to automatically fall in place. We did this experiment with a banking customer of ours. We just told them, you know, how can you use technology to stop or minimize debit card fraud? So what they did is, by default, all the debit cards come unactivated. And you have the ability to activate or deactivate your debit card simply by sending a text message. You want to go to the ATM, unblock your card using a text message, make the withdrawal, and block the card again. And then no unauthorized activity can be performed on your card without you unblocking it until somebody comes and hacks Signal System 7. And then you're like, 
with every problem, there's a solution. With every solution, there's another problem. But we can fix that as we go along. This has by far stopped a hell of a lot of debit card frauds. The other example I want to give you is, you know, instant messaging, like say, for example, Telegram. It tells you where somebody else is logged in from and gives you the ability to kill it if you want to remotely. So yeah, put the user in charge of security, make security visible again, make security great again. Joe, uh, Joe Fitz gave me this, this actually this hack before the 2016 elections. And it's one of my priceless treasures. When we talk about this whole, you know, security by passwords, that's the lowest common denominator we have. What has happened over the years? Like information practitioners like us, we kept on telling the industry that, you know, choose complex passwords, minimum length, uppercase, lowercase. We instead trained people to basically use passwords that are hard for humans to remember, but easy for computers to guess. As a result, we have still password compromises. People still write them down. They still get, you know, copied in a text file. They still get exfiltrated. They still get brute forced en masse. And this, this, this still happens. Why are we trying to still keep beating this dead horse of passwords? There are products that don't use passwords at all. Why aren't we adopting their model? Because we are too stagnated in our thinking. I use WhatsApp. WhatsApp doesn't use passwords at all. And for those of you who use WhatsApp web, if you want to sign in to WhatsApp using your browser, you take your phone, aim it at this QR code, you're logged in, and if you want to log out, just go to your phone, click on log out, and you're done. No passwords at all. No question of password brute forcing or harvesting. If you look at Gmail, Gmail tells you a history of all the past login activity. And if you detect any unauthorized activity from any IP address or a geolocation or a new browser device, it gives you a little bank statement for you to take action upon. It puts you in control. This lesson of putting the user in control of their security has to be extrapolated all over our digital society. And to this, I have to say in a few words of conclusion that the four elements of cybersecurity as I've learned over the past 20 years, are very simple. It's transparency, metrics, resilience, and lastly, your users and your users' trust. So far in the past 20 years, we've been resisting. We always fought with the user. We've not owned the charter of security. We always passed the buck to somebody else, get it off my back. We always thrived on reactive security, rules, signatures, updates, patches, until we get hit again. We always squandered money in the next short-lived security product to last us for the next six months, and then it all evaporates. It becomes ineffective, but keeps accruing technical debt. We've encumbered our users. We've made security as a pain in the posterior for them. And we, as a cybersecurity industry, have become fear mongers. Instead, we have to resonate, not resist. Own your security. Take charge of it. Build defendable systems, not cumbersome systems. Put security and trustworthiness at the core of your function. Instead of encumbering users, empower your users. And lastly, don't sell fear, sell trust. And that's how we're going to win this game. To quote the wisest person that I know, Kung Fu Panda, there is no secret ingredient. So that, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your time and for your attention. My name is Saumil Shah, and you can reach me somewhere in cyberspace. Thank you very much.